Father Yahweh, thank you for this time. We thank you that for the opportunity to come here and meet, fellowship around your word. Father, I pray that you send your Ruach here. Let it descend upon us. Help us to see truth, to share it, and to learn and grow one from another and to be encouraging, Father. Thank you for today. Thank you for the start of the week. And I pray that you walk with each one of us, all of my brothers and sisters, as they go throughout the week. And I pray that you use them for your good works, Father. In the name of Yeshua, your beloved Son. Amen. Amen. So, to, so tonight, um, I was telling Jackson earlier, I, there's a hole in the team up calendar. Not a hole, I guess, but there was an there was an opportunity. Monday evenings, we didn't have anything going on. So um, initially, what my plan is, is I wanted to start a teaching series and um, just about some various topics. But um, I didn't do anything for tonight because mainly because of Wednesday night, I'm, I'm, I'm working on that. So, but also, more importantly, I am very interested. I know that I think everybody here, I'm not sure about Hebrew Girl, but I think everybody here has watched uh, or been present at most of either the stuff that I've put out lately or the or Jackson stuff on Paul. Mm. So what I would like to do is I, I would love to hear everybody's thoughts on it. Like where where does everybody, and this is why I'm saying this, okay? The reason why I want to know is because of, of directions that I would like to go. I, I've, I've been praying to Yahweh a lot about I feel like he wants me to share some stuff, you know, via YouTube or Zoom or however we can do it. But I'm not really sure what yet. But i am just really been stirred up about Paul lately the last month or two. But uh, just from judging from some of the Facebook posts, like on Jackson's video when he posts about his stuff on Paul, you know, I people just jump on there and just immediately just, you know, spew all kinds of stuff you know and this is my thing about it is that there's no reason when somebody comes like that in my opinion i'm not interested in 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 conversations and interactions and back and forth arguments with people back and forth discussions absolutely but like i've said clearly from the start of this whole series i've said that if you don't like Paul, then the series is not going to benefit you. And it's just, we all know that it's proven to be true. You mentioned Paul and you either have someone's ear to hear what you have to present, or you have somebody just fuming, waiting to get the mic just to, to crucify him, so to speak. So, um, so I was curious as to that. I was really curious as to what everybody honestly thinks about Paul, Shaul, is he an apostle? Is he is he somebody we should be uh, listening to, or does he have information for us, or should we just tear his epistles out of our Bibles and be done with them? Um, I'm really interested to hear what other people have to say, and as a part B to this, and I, and I'm really glad Jackson was here. Um, I would like to know what everybody's overall thoughts, if you care to share, regarding the end times. Whether uh, the people are uh, believe or say that it, it concluded in AD 70 around that time, you know, with the destruction of Israel and Jerusalem, or there are some that say uh, it, it happened then, but it's going to cyclically repeat again, especially if they rebuild the temple, all that. And there's some that say it's all yet future. So I was just kind of curious, you know, and and I've heard, I've have we have had many discussions with most of you guys about it. You know, and I have great respect for both views. You know, I have my own views on it. But so I guess the reason why I want to know that is just to get a footing. I want to know if I'm if I'm going to get into all this Greek, because there's still a lot more Greek to look at. I mean, those were those three or four words we looked at were just scratching the surface. There's a lot more Paul has to say. Greek words that mean a lot that I think we may have glossed over over the over the, the time in seminaries and other such things. But like Jackson's always said. I really believe if you become a, at least a, a semi-serious study uh, student of the Greek language, um, these new translations, Jackson with the Concordia literal that I've been using, and then the, um, the Rotherham's Emphasized Bible, they're both early 1900 translations. 
and they are phenomenal. They are, I, I, I have never found, and Jackson can speak better than me, but I have never found an English translation that I feel, just based on my own limited studies into the Greek, that have been closer in translation to that. So, so, I, so with that, I'd like to kind of hop off here and just listen and see what everybody has to say. Because I, because I honestly am really listening. And you know what? I'm really thankful, guys, for this ministry. You know, and I, I don't care how many views it gets. I don't care how many. I don't care about none of that. I just care that the people that want to hear and that are open to at least consider are here. And I am thankful to Yahweh for that. Amen. There's my scar right there, one of them. Here's the other one. They're looking good. You hurt me so bad with those words that I just scarred up. That's pretty. Yeah, that one that, that one doesn't look like it's healed too well on your neck. That's got red stuff on it. Betadine, oh. whatever that stuff is. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Well, I've been looking into Paul this week. I can talk a little bit. But not the whole time. No, just yes, I, please do. I can talk a little bit. I but I do want to hear the opinions of the other ones, especially our resident apostle. That is Apostle Gregory Holsapple. He's on the he's on kind of on the fence. I'm pretty much on the fence, but I have been looking at something today, yesterday, the day before. I splurged on a new book, primarily because <clears throat> there are <clears throat> there are none of these that I can find that are used. I usually buy used books, good or acceptable, because I do I do read a lot, and I'll show you one here that I purchased not long ago. This one right here, the Ebionites. Mainly I purchased it because I wanted to see if there's anything in here that I hadn't already known, that I hadn't read about before. By John Wu Vujie, Vujie, I don't know. Twenty-seven thirty-one. Vujichik, Vujichik. Is this a new book or is this an older one that's been reprinted? I think that it's fairly new. Nineteen. Oh yeah, nineteen. Three hundred fifty-six. So it's big. I read the first three chapters so far. Nothing new so far with the exception of he does, in those three chapters, talk quite a bit about Ellen White, Ellen G. White, the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist movement, and how yes. she uses Paul to abrogate the, um, the other disciples. And she talks about how we need to follow what Paul says, and really, she doesn't name the other ones. But she says, that is the true way, and anyone that is not interested in his gospel, then let them be accursed, something like that. So, I uh, before going, was it this morning? I think it was, it was today sometime. I wrote a few things down. How much is it on that one, Vicki? 20 bucks. I couldn't find any used. So I started looking again. When I read that um, Ellen White quote and what his response to that was, I decided to look at Galatians a little bit more. Just another run through. And I'm just using ge generic Bibles here. <clears throat> but I wrote a few passages down and a few questions. And I started Galatians 1.8, quoting Paul, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. That's an anathema. You be cursed. 
As we said before, so say I again. If anyone preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now, who is he speaking of regarding preaching other gospels? See just a couple other passages that he says something similar to this. I looked at Romans 2.16. In the day when Elohim shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Romans 16 then, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and, uh, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. What I get from this is he's saying that the secret did, might have been Jesus Christ preaching, but the revelation is his, which has been kept secret since the world began. That is a tremendous boast there, I think anyway. And then 2 Timothy 2.8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Uh, who's, who else is preaching gospels at this time? Um, I guess it was last Tuesday night. No, it was last night with the Barnabas study. I mentioned that the other movements that were early Christian type movements that we know of were the Abionites and the Gnostics. They both took the gospel in different ways. Like, for instance, the Abionites, of course, as you know, didn't see Jesus Christ as being supernatural. They really didn't like that name, Jesus Christ, anyway. They didn't believe in the atoning blood. May I say Yahshua HaMashiach? They didn't believe that he was any more than a righteous teacher. And they claimed that they were the successor to him. And that may be true. I'm thinking, where can we read Ebionite stuff today? Well, there isn't much of it. There isn't much of it. There's only a little piece of the gospel of the Ebionites. And they're not even sure that that's what is there. Except, you know, we got in the third century, we got a guy named, um, named um, Epiphanius who tells us about all these different sects of Judaism and Christianity. And he tells us that the Ebionites were named after somebody named Ebion, which is really doubtful because, of course, Ebionite means the poor. It's the poor, and it's the poor sp spoken of in Acts as well. And in Luke, in the passage about, that's the Sermon on the Plain, he says the poor in spirit, I think. He says the poor in spirit. That would be the Ebionites. They called them the poor in doctrine not in spirit, because they have such a low Christology. Their belief that Yahshua was not, uh, was not divine in any way, and that he only became the son of Elohim at his baptism. So they were adoptionists. And then the third one, outside what became Orthodox Christianity, or at this time, Pauline Christianity, was the was the Gnostics, and that that's a category all by itself. So uh, the Gnostics were just the very opposite of the Ebionites. They didn't believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh at all. They believed that he was a spirit, and some of the 
some pretty crazy doctrine today, very similar to the New Age movement of today. And I was mentioning that today there's a very, very popular Ebionite preacher on uh, YouTube, a man that was uh, my right-hand man in the Yahad for a number of years. And one of the Ebionite laws was that if you're not a vegetarian, you cannot be saved anyway. And he began to preach this, and of course we tangled about it. There's no way in the world you can prove anything like that with any scripture. In fact, scripture is just almost completely against that idea. And so we we uh, went our separate ways, but he's still on. He's he's really, really popular. And some of his older ones refer to the Yahad. So we get some views still from his stuff. I'm off the subject, aren't I? Going back to Galatians 1.11, Paul says, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me that is, my gospel, is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it. He had no teacher, except by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And here we have again this conundrum we've talked about a hundred times. Can we believe what Luke or Epaphrodites, maybe, Epaphroditus wrote in Acts chapter 9. Concerning Paul's vision. I can't find any place in Paul's letters where he refers to it. All he says that he, he went. He was in Damascus. He went to Damascus after uh, the believers and something happened. But the whole story is in Luke's Acts 9, whereas Paul does never talk about it. Do we believe that? Can we believe that? Then go, go to Galatians 2.11. And here we get into the crux of the problem. The... I don't know if it's the breaking point, but it surely the visible breaking point between the apostles in Judea and Paul himself, and that is, but when Pita was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed, remembering that Damascus was the home of the what do we call them? I don't like to call them Jewish Christians. Damascus was the home primarily of the Jesus movement. The Antiochian assembly was the home of Paul and Barnabas. So Antioch is going to be the more liberal place. So when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed for before that certain people came from James, who was the absolute head of the movement at this time. He did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Now we're seeing Paul defining himself by defining his, as Nazarene Acts says, his enemy. They're of the circumcision. Obviously, I'm not of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimilitude. Dissimulation. There we go. Even Barnabas goes, and last night, you know, we studied Barnabas, and we're getting to know him a lot better, <laughs> a lot better now, and, and through these studies on Sunday, 
uh, we're getting to appreciate that book more. So my comment on this was that Peter and Barnabas didn't want to offend those who came by the command of James. If Peter and Barnabas are anything like they are described in other books, they're not the, the type to, to put their tail between their legs like that. But I see this as rather than offending the Gentiles, they were correcting a problem here. Maybe it was their own problem. But anyway, they had the attitude just like Paul did. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. They ate with Gentiles. So what? Well, you see, Peter in the Nazarene Acts, the Clementines, never eats with people who are not converted. Not even Clement. So Peter and Barnabas didn't want to offend those who came by the command of James, who was head of the assembly. And uh, it's almost like James is sending spies. I think Paul says that, sending spies to report on our liberty. Then we go to Galatians 2.19. For I, through the Torah, nomos in Greek, law is always the cover word for Torah. I, through the Torah, am dead to the Torah, that I might live unto Elohim. And this is an outrageous statement next. I am crucified with Messiah. Nevertheless, I live, but not I. I don't live here, but Messiah lives in me. We pass that over. We don't think about the gravity of that kind of attitude. We think, oh, well, yeah, Jesus is going to go in my heart and live in my heart. Where do you find that in the scripture? Where did Jesus say, say that? Come let me live in your heart or actually in your kidneys rather than the heart. And he continues, and the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of Elohim, who loved me and gave himself for me. That is a church doctrine that I can't say if it's right or if it's not. All I can say is that I know for a fact, if you read Galatians 2 and James 3, that James knew this letter. Too much similarity between them. And uh, verse 21, I do not frustrate the grace of Elohim, for if righteousness come by the Torah, then Messiah is dead in vain. Well, isn't it pretty mm, obvious? that if one accepts the grace of Elohim, that they have to live by a certain standard. Every time Yahshua talks about salvation, he talks about word of Elohim, that is commandments, Torah, and the testimony of Yahshua, not only in Revelation, but in John as well. Verse 21. Oh, yeah, I already read that one. But one thing, I, when reading this, I always think about James and Kipha. These guys not only followed Yahshua, but James was purportedly his brother. I know I've done this illustration before a few times, but in my family, I'm the oldest of three men. The second oldest is also a preacher and very well-known minister, um, missionary. And my youngest brother is too. Now, he doesn't talk much about it. He works with bikers and that kind of stuff. But Peter and I have been in very formal ministry situations. 
And we can't get along at all. He's the one that said that I started a dangerous cult and that I'm a dangerous cult leader. And he told everybody that. You see, he's absolutely straight orthodox. Straight orthodox. He won't even say Yahshua. Although he knows all the stuff about Torah, he won't do it. I got after him a number of times uh, sitting there eating uh, eating unclean foods, right? Uh, unclean non-foods right in front of me. And I, I said, you are, uh, you are offending me. You as a minister are offending me by eating that big plate full of pig or whatever. And it seemed like you did it on purpose to get a reaction. I tell him, hey, you should know better than that. All right, what if somebody was to come along and say, or what if, uh, what if somebody was like my brother was to come along and he say, I don't live anymore, but it's Jesus Christ that lives in me. He lives through me. I'm dead. I don't really live. Or better, if somebody comes along and says that uh, they want to teach me the true gospel, and he says, uh, I can, I'm perfectly qualified to teach it because the spirit of your dead brother lives in me, and I don't live, but he lives through me, and I'm nothing. He walks in me and talks in me, etc. How would I feel about that? I think about how would James feel about that? How would Kifa feel about that? Would they be offended? Or would they say, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, Christ lives in everybody that, that uh, invites him into his heart. I would be amazed um, because I think growing up with a brother or a sister, you know where their faults are. You see their faults. And John even talks about in John 10 that James didn't like his brother much. Come on over to the feast. Come on. You got to be famous. You've got to be seen out here. He says, it's not my hour. The only way he could go to the feast, Yahshua could go to the feast, was to do it in a purloined fashion. So uh, I think that this would be extremely offensive to those who came from James. And I'm sure this letter got around to all those people. So I'm thinking about righteousness. What about the righteousness of the Torah? Is it of no effect? It certainly seems like Paul uh, is saying that really all you need to do is ask Jesus into your heart. That's the very thing that all these Christians do because Paul is the founder of Christianity. Even N.T. Wright will tell you that. Speaking of orthodoxy, no scholars today say that Yahshua HaMashiach started Christianity. They all know better than that. Yahshua may have started Ebionism, but certainly not the Christianity such as it is today. To abrogate the law, to tell people that uh, all foods are clean, etc., etc., no more circumcision, no more Judaism. All you need is faith in the grace, like Lutherans say today. Let's ask Paul about righteousness. In Romans 2.13, he says, For it's not the hearers of the Torah who are righteous before Elohim. They're not. But the doers of the Torah who will be justified. You got to understand the technical term there, justified. That means 
like Christians say, I got saved on such a day, such and such a day at this very hour. That is not salvation. That's not getting saved. That may be getting justified. That's the first step. Even Paul tells you, you have to get justified. Then you go through sanctification. Then you can go into glorification. And there's another term there in the list of, of uh, evolution of the spirit. So we looked at Paul there. He talks about righteousness being the righteous people, the Zadikim being the doers of Torah. And they will be justified. All right. Let's go over to John. Ask John. First John 3, 4. You know this one. Everyone who practices sin practices Torahlessness or lawlessness. Indeed, sin is Torahlessness. That's all the testimonies I get on that. But you know what Yahshua said about the law? Not a jot or tittle. If there's a judgment day coming from all for all people, what in the world will be the measures by which the judge can adjudicate? You see, the judge going to just ask like Saint Ethelbert what he thinks about a case? What do you think about this one here, Ethelbert? Or will he judge? Through consulting with Michael the Archangel. Or with a renowned Torah teacher, like, you know, a dead rabbi. Will he learn how many offices the guy held in the church or in the Masons? What is the measure? Or will he just look to see if Jesus is in the heart someplace? You heard that one story about the mother teaching the child that about Jesus living in the heart. And the baby says, oh, mom, mom, let me let me hear Jesus. And the baby puts his head up against the mother's chest, actually stomach. And the baby says, after mother asks, well, do you hear him? Baby says, Yes, yes, he's making coffee. By what measure will the judge adjudicate the righteous Jewish person who doesn't seem to have Jesus living in his heart? Will that one then be condemned? What about a native from a jungle in New Guinea? Like, it's natural, except in some people, that what is right and what is wrong is laid on their hearts. As I mentioned, the last preaching I did was uh, um, John chapter 5, 19 and on, where we have different classes of resurrection. You've got the, um, the justified, number one, they don't die. The good, they're brought back to life in human flesh, and the evil that are resurrected to a trial. Will, um, say, a prostitute who listens to the message, if you were to die this night, do you know whether you go to heaven or hell? And she answers that call and asks Jesus into her heart. And then, oh, I've, I've got to go. I've got a John coming over right now. Elohim says that for those who are his chosen people, his bakarim, he will put the Torah into their hearts, or like I said, literally kidneys or livers. Paul is noted as one having his own gospel, to condemning a number of Torah practices as foolish and lawless, and three, denigrating the apostles of Messiah in the Galatians, the Messiah who was their teacher's teacher for years, 
And we've heard that Paul never met Yahshua by, by revelation. And fourth, dismiss the need for both grace and law as measures of judgment. Not two, but one, grace only. The Lutherans have Paul down. Do you wonder why we question the authority of Paul? Do you wonder why more people don't question that authority? Do we question that story by Luke found in Acts 9? Have we no right to question what has been canonized and authorized by the Roman Catholic Church? Talking about the canon of Scripture here. Boy, I took up a lot of time. But this is what's going through my mind again. I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater because he, he has some very powerful and necessary things to say. We might also ask ourselves, was it the intention of Elohim to split the movement into two, three, or four different parts? Okay, th those are my musings for the day, and I took a long time, and I'm sorry. That's okay, brother. No, um, I had some, th I, I jotted some notes as you were talking, so I wanted to talk about a little bit of it. I think, I think the problem with Paul is, well, one, I don't think there is a problem with Paul. I think that, okay, when we talk about the gospel, Paul talks about that gospel that I preach among the nations and that gospel that I preach. And, and people think gospel, they think Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15. The gospel of, of life or salvation, like the, like the Christian church teaches. I don't think that's what Paul's talking about. Because there's only both, 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 the, both the, the gospels that we have, Paul's writings, as well as James, the Nazarene Acts, and the book of Acts, all talk about life in the Messiah. The, it, all the gospels are centered around the Messiah, the Son of the Most High. I think what Paul's gospel that he's talking about, that that Peter and James, you know, initially, I think later on, maybe they started to have some understanding, but initially had problems with Paul. And I think that the, the book of Acts records who his problems were with. They weren't with the Romans and with the Gentiles. It was with the, the, the Jewish people. And <laughs> the reason why is because of his gospel. His gospel is what we've been talking about for several sessions now. As he says what it is in, in Colossians, Ephesians, um, Corinthians, and Romans. At the end of Romans, Rome, or Jackson read it tonight. He, Paul is saying that he has a secret, that Yahweh, a mystery, hid in himself and disclosed it to the nations. And the gospel message that everybody had the problem with wasn't that Gentiles were getting saved or redeemed because Peter was shown that in, in Acts chapter 10. It, you know, while he was still preaching, the Holy Spirit sealed them, fell upon them, they started speaking to come. So Peter says, shouldn't we baptize? I mean, who can say not to baptize? And they have received the gift just as us. What Paul's mystery is, what Paul's good news, evangel to the nations are, is that you nations now who used to be far off and apart from the citizenship of Israel and had no covenants and with, without hope in the world, but now you, Yahweh, has deemed that we're far off are now near. And he says, now the nations, the Gentiles, the nations, all the different nations, through faith in the Son of the Most High, are now joint heirs together, joint partakers, with it says, with them, or with the brethren, or with the beloved. Well, who's he talking about? In this previous chapter in Ephesians 2, it tells him, it is the Jew and the Gentile, and the, and the anger and the enmity between them. Messiah destroyed at the cross when he died, and the veil was split. There is no, there is no difference now. A Jew, or a, there's no difference. So Paul's saying, the Gentiles are now joint heirs together apart 
from becoming a proselyte. They don't have to be Jewish. They don't have to get circumcised. They don't have to keep the Torah. According, when I say that, I'm not talking about the Torah that, that Yeshua fills up, the ones that the 10, the festivals, I'm, I'm not talking about those. The, the Torah that, that applies to the Gentiles, they are to keep. And it starts when a new person gets redeemed, it starts with the first four that Yaakov said, because he has to have those, especially back then, to even socialize with them. So they can learn the Torah, hear it every week, and learn from it. And Paul talks about that, and we're going to talk about it Wednesday. He talks about the Torah, what, it, what Paul is saying. And, and listen, let's just, be, let's just ask ourselves a question, okay? Were we, re were we redeemed? I invite everybody to ask this. Were you redeemed the day that you became a believer in the Messiah? For real, from your heart, true repentance. Did you receive the gift of the Ruach HaKodesh that came in and sealed you until the day of redemption? Did you get that by keeping the Torah, like Paul says? Or did you get it by the hearing of trusting faithfulness? Did you believe what was told for you and you repented and you cried out to the Most High and to His Son and He saved you? He sealed you with the Holy Spirit. So what's that mean? They got fire insurance? Absolutely not. Because even Paul says over, and we're going to talk about it Wednesday, over and over again. He's, he talks, like I've been trying to say before, Paul talks about life and the race, earning the prize. And that's what he's talking about. Life in the Messiah is a free gift that the Son of God gives to us freely. But walking the race, walking our walks out, Working out our own salvation, running the race, hoping for the prize like Paul, like we've been talking about. There's only one thing that's ever done that, and that's the Torah. And that's what he says in Ephesians 2. And it's what he says in Timothy. He says it everywhere to keep the Torah. But the Torah, keeping the Torah without having faith in the Son of God will not redeem you. And that's what Paul's talking about. You don't have to do this or that. In order to be redeemed, if you have a relationship with the Son of the Most High, He will redeem you, He will seal you, He will change your heart, He will write the Torah on your heart, and then you start to, to work out and live out your Torah. Not as a checklist, but as, a, as, as, as evidence and as fruit of a changed heart. You know what I mean? Like, like we're just a new person. Seriously, we're a new person. You and I don't go to places we used to go to. For those of us that were unredeemed at one time, in times past, we don't go to those places. We don't do those things. We don't think those things. We Because that's not because of, we can do anything. It's because Yahweh is working through his Ruach in our lives as we walk. We learn the Torah. The more we learn, the more we take on, as much as we can bear, like the Didache says, bear that. If you can bear it all, you are blessed. But if you can't, what you can bear, bear that. And, that, and, that's, and that's just growth. He's not saying bear it and stop. They're saying go. You go and, and, and you do as much as you can for the kingdom of Yahweh in the name of his son. And you grow and you walk and you learn. And Paul sees it as a race. You strive for the end. You go for the goal. You beat yourself into subjection, so to speak. So, when, so I think when he's talking about that, that, that gospel, I don't think it's, it's not talking about, it's, it's not talking about uh, life. In Messiah, it's talking about the rest. Like when you be, become a, his child, you continue to walk. But honestly, how was how was getting redeemed done? I mean, I can honestly say I was initially redeemed by by the Son of, of God, the Most High Yeshua, when I cried out to Him in repentance. But it, it didn't have anything to do with my good works or anything else. But what He did is He convicted my heart, and even before I was turned or shown. The, about the validity of the Torah and, and how foundational it is to everything. I, I didn't know that. I was a Christian. I didn't know that. What I did know is that I was now convicted to not say horrible things, to not use, you know, the name of the Lord in vain, you know, and just all the different things as I learned and grew, I started, he started turning me away from things, even though I didn't really even know what the Torah said, but I was keeping it just out of faith because I, because I knew that I had to trust the followings of the Ruach, you know, so I, I, and that was my walk, you know, so as I learned, I've grown, as I learned today, I grow, I mean, we all do, right, we learn new stuff, but we grow more even, 
But that's what I think the problem is that Paul was not always talking about life in Messiah, entering into the new covenant with him. He's talking about the walk, the thing where we're going to be righteously judged and weighed out. Remember, judging is a divine weighing out. And like Jackson said, how's he going to weigh us out? What's the standard? We, there, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. There's only one standard that's ever been given for righteous behavior, so to speak, for righteousness before Yahweh, and that's his word, his Torah, which his son embodies and fills up. So that's kind of what I think about it. I don't think it's, I don't, I think Peter and Paul had more issues with the fact that nations were kind of seen as the same and equal rather than, because they weren't before. This was never before, you know, like I said, Peter had to be shown a special vision for that. But okay, so I'm going to be quiet now. I'm going to read the chat. I, I didn't have the chat open, so I'm going to go back and read it now. Shalom, shalom. I'll put my uh, three cents in here. My camera went on strike, it looks like. But uh, yeah, I, I absolutely believe in Paul. I don't believe uh, probably everything that we see because if they can take out Yahweh and put in, you know, Bell or Lord or whatever, then obviously they can change things. Things have been changed. We are we know that we're not that novice, I hope. But I do believe, especially as uh, being taught a lot of things, I haven't been taught by man. I come to the Sabbath from praying and searching. So I think I see somewhat, and maybe because I travel and go to places, I think I do see through Paul's eyes somewhat, if you can say that, or I know kind of how and what uh, he went through or what he was doing. Uh, you know, for like here, for to say Jesus, you know, I know a lot of people say, oh my God, you know, I'm like, oh, you know, but for those who are taught, then why would we say that? Why would we say, why would we not use Yeshua? Why would we not use Yahweh, the proper names? So I think when he went to these places and he was talking to Gentiles or pagans or, you know, he had a different avenue of approach. Just like if I go to a Sunday school, I'm not going to tell them, hey, you little kids are all a bunch of little, you know, pagans and you Jesus followers and just annihilate them because they're going to throw me out and nothing's going to be accomplished. But if I go to somewhere where I have taught before, it, even though it's a Sunday church, you know, even though that they do that, but I have taught them the feast, I have taught them the name and they come up with a lot of different things then, you know, we might have especially brother-to-brother -brother problem. But to go to places, uh, you know, Ellen White, you go to Seven Day Adventist and you just go bombard her and tell her, well, you know, women are not teachers. And just to slice things in half, everything's got to be given accordingly. You know, it's got to be line by line, precept by precept. And I think we don't get that in reading and going to the Torah and understanding what he was trying to accomplish, uh, just like Brother Jackson was saying earlier, you know, about going and eating. Can I not eat with my family if they're going out to eat? Can I not eat with a sinner? What if this homeless guy is sitting here eating ham sandwich, right? <laughs> what if he's sitting here? Then I should leave. So I think there's some tolerance there as to, you know, I'm going to sit down and talk with these people if they want me there. If they don't want me there, if they obviously don't like what I'm saying or, or you know, we're not, nothing's going to be accomplished, then there's nothing to do there anyway, as far as the kingdom. But even if they never seen a Bible in their life, then, you know, just having a conversation, I find just talking with some of these people is you know, that that's where it all starts, that where it, it has to start, just the conversation and, and getting to know a little bit about their background, what they know. And some, you know, some know quite a lot, some don't know, and some reject. And then going into the whole Paul haters, if you will, I think a lot of that is like, you know, simply Hebrew roots, people that want to fight, start chaos, 
they find things, they they all can agree to disagree or to, you know, like Brother Jack said earlier too, you know, those cult people are the, it's another hateful thing to throw out. And I think that's all missed a lot of times with, you know, with Paul, because I, I, I feel the same way, you know, because some people, if they watch my videos or watch this, but if they see me in a church, they wouldn't even recognize that same attitude, if you will. They wouldn't recognize that. They just, I don't think they understand it, you know, and some people have called me from Sunday church and claimed I have said things that I've never said. And so much so that I was like, I don't really repeat names or say names unless, you know, it's Joe Osteen or somebody that, you know, they can handle it, I'm sure. But, you know, I usually don't do that. So I went and got the CD because at the time I made the CDs and I got the CD and I played it back and there wasn't a word about them or their pastor or anything about that church. And I took it to him and I said, you're, you're wrong. You know, I'm just going to let you know that you accused me of something. And I never said any of that. I never said it about your church and I never called your pastor out. And here's the CD. If you'd like to play it. Oh, I don't have a CD player. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you don't yeah. have a CD. Player. Oh yeah. yeah. You do, right. You know what, want to borrow mine. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> but I think a lot of that, you know, we see a lot of that, I think, in scriptures. And then if things are changed, rearranged, or upside down, and then, of course, like what you were saying earlier, you know, that they want to be, that's their leader in Christian or churchianity or, you know, in the Christian mode, and that doesn't really line up with Yeshua. So what do I do? What you know, if that doesn't line up totally perfect with this, then Paul has to be wrong or, or you know, something's got to give. So if we just get rid of Paul, then it makes it better. And, you know, the same thing that with with the Torah. Uh, I had a friend, Joey, and he's got Light of Yeshua Ministries in Mobile, Alabama. And he used to say, "What what's the big deal with the Torah. Why is it so hard? Like you put on there a while ago. What's so hard about keeping the Torah? Is it not dating a goat? Is it not going with your mama? And it was a joke seven, eight years ago. Today, it's almost you'd probably get in trouble at the wrong church for saying that same thing. But honestly, I think he was, you know, drawing people right back to the to the instructions because exactly what else are we going to be judged on what can we be judged on is it just going to be what i believe what you believe what you know what my pastor believed or so we i think we all agree that we can only be judged by the true judgment and the true judge um you know so there's just so much of that going on though so much you see from all the different Hebrew roots, messianic, but I think a lot of it becomes a a turmoil more than a, like this. Let's get to the bottom of it. Let's find out the truth. And I have no problem with the truth if it's the truth, if we can study it out and find it and agree upon it. But I don't think a lot of groups that I've seen or been a part of have that same, you know, mentality. They don't, they don't agree. They don't want to agree. They just you know, if you put the scriptures down in front of them and said, read this, they would still believe what they want to believe. So that's my take on it. And I, I just glad to be here that I think, uh, you know, I love it. Love that we're doing this and I can be a part of it. Shalom. Yahweh bless. That was good. How about you, Vicki? Your turn. Um, well, I think that, um, when Paul was talking about Christ living in him, um, you know, like the, the, the passage that I posted in Deuteronomy, um, Deuteronomy chapter 30. And he always says it is not, it's not a difficult thing to do. It's not a hard thing to do. 
It is not across the sea. It is not up in the heavens where you have to send somebody after it. It's in your mouth and in your heart to do it. So if so to extrapolate from that, if Yehoshua was the living Torah, then you can say that that living Torah is in your heart. It's in your mouth and in your heart to do it. So that's how I take that that Paul said. Um, I don't have... I know Paul, for some people, is, is, is difficult to understand. I think Galatians, in mind, this is my opinion, I think Galatians has more to do with Yehoshua's priesthood, his priesthood than anything. And I think, or I suspect, I won't say that, you know, I know because I don't know, but I suspect that at least part of the secret that Paul was able to, um, part of the secret that Paul had was the Melchizedek priesthood, you know, and, and also on the, another point, I just, what I just said before, you know, David prayed to Yahweh, please do not take your spirit from me. So where is the spirit? Where, where is the Ruach HaKodesh? Where is it? If it isn't, within us in some in some way um i agree that you know it's um it isn't you know i am vicky uh i am not messiah i am vicky and i think that the struggle we each every day we struggle to do better today and walk in tour better today than we did yesterday and um it's so to me when paul says things like that I, I don't have a problem with it because i can i can i just am always reminded with what torah says and so i can understand where he's coming from when he says things like that that maybe the the mainstream Christian church or the Catholic church or, you know, maybe have, have, would they absolutely have definitely put a lot of emphasis on, on Paul, um, more so than the teachings of Messiah and the teachings of Torah. There's no doubt about that. But I think that, you know, for me, I try to have a balance when I read Paul, and I don't read Paul a great deal, I've, you know, I've read him all my life, but I don't, you know, read him a great deal like I do other parts of scripture. Um, so, but I, I don't have a problem understanding Paul. And as far as Peter and his food goes and is not eating with certain people, well, Peter is not the one that, that any of us are supposed to or called to emulate. We are called to walk with Messiah, not Peter. I love Peter. He's actually my favorite disciple. But um, so that's kind of like just some cursory thoughts on, on Paul. I think I, I'm not sure, you know, exactly. I, I think that his secret is, is multifaceted. I don't think it's one particular thing. I think it's a myriad of things um, that, that, his, that, that encompass this secret. And I'm not sure that it's a secret that is given only to him, only. I think that all of us here certainly have good understandings of a lot of the secrets of Torah, things that we were never taught in church, except for maybe you, Jackson, because you've been doing this for so long. But, you know, I haven't. And so I was raised in a Baptist church and it was once you're saved, you're always saved and you can never, you can never lose your salvation. It doesn't matter what you do. You can never lose your salvation. And so, and the whole idea of salvation, the whole, when were you saved? It's written in the front of every Baptist Bible. 
the date and time that they were saved, except for mine, it's not. But um, so I, I agree with that. It's, it definitely is. It's, it's a pathway that we choose to walk on with Messiah. It's a journey. It's a lifelong. It is a race. And for me, when Paul talks about that race, that's what he's talking about, that journey of salvation. And it is, it, it's a journey, not, it's not an event. I think it's, I think salvation is something completely different than born again. Um, I think it's a process that takes you to being born again. And so that, but I, for me, that's what Galatians, to me, the way I read it is more about the priesthood of Mashiach. And I believe, you know, that the Bible is about marriage from beginning to end. It's, it's about marriage. It starts with marriage. It ends with, it ends with marriage. And everything in between is all about that reconciliation and that proper marriage relationship, that legitimate marriage relationship that we are to have with our bridegroom. Um, and that's really all I have to say about it. I mean, I could go on and on and on and on, but, you know, I kind of wasn't prepared to really say a whole lot. Paul's different too. Paul in Paul's epistles, he never uses the word lamb, the word bride, which is different too. I mean, there's definite that, and that's what I said in the other lesson. There's notable, there's different people that have problems with Paul because there are notable differences. Like Jackson brought some up, we're bringing them up. There are differences. It's just whether you Acts chapter nine. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, I had a um, couple things come to mind there too that. Uh, the Ruach, it's inside of you, but we're not robots. You know, I, I kind of get that too, that what he's saying is you are led, you know, according to scripture, every step, everything we do is supposed to be led by the Ruach. Now, whether we accept that and follow it or do our own thing, I think that's kind of what maybe he's alluding to there is what he's saying. Uh, preaching, I've found so-called secrets or things that come to mind that I didn't even know I haven't even studied was never in my notes was never even a part of what I was going to talk about it just come out and to me you know uh, Stephanie my wife sometimes sees that it's like my eyes get big it's like whoa you know I just taught myself no the Ruach just taught me that you know so there's the Ruach within there that I believe is a part of you that's teaching us, that's telling us, that's saying, hey, watch this or look at this. And I can believe that can be secrets as well. I think there's some things, again, going to certain places and teaching certain people that if they're babes, if they're just figuring this out, if they're just asking to be taught not to drown them, not to give them that fire hose effect, you know, and I mean, that means so much. And I believe the Ruach actually gives you that as well. Um, just today, we was actually coming home and we got a pizza and just cheese pizza. We, you know, cheese pizza, got it going on, coming home. And halfway home, I'm like, hey, check and make sure we ain't got a pepperoni pizza. And Stephanie's like, what? What? You didn't order that? What? And she opened the box and there was a pepperoni pizza before we got home and got all upset. So, you know, I think a lot of times that things that happen, if we listen, it even keeps us from spending more time and doing things and to recognize what's going on and just using the Ruach. It's, it's not a robot type thing, you know, and I think that's another thing that a lot of, uh, like going into salvation, once and done, I don't think they maybe even want to comprehend that you know as to i'm saved so therefore what's the point what you know what do i have to do if you don't have to do anything at this point then what's the point you know and i i can see that because why do anything why get dressed up and go to church why keep even the sabbath if you're saved and all this so i think a lot of that is you know going within the teaching and the ruach urging or compelling you to learn these you know to learn the truth and learn more and the more that we 
run this marathon, I think the more that we understand what's going on. And I believe he gives us little things here and there to let us, you know, to help our help our own feeble minds if for nothing else. Shalom, that's all I got for now. It's a tough subject for sure. I'm wondering, there are like three more people here that haven't said anything. Anybody have uh, further comments on this idea? I'd sure be interested in hearing. Just threw that list up on chat, brother, for those scriptures from Paul's epistles for you. I do think it is important. I, I think it's really, really important to talk about Paul um, because... Like Sean said at the beginning, you know, when you put that post up on your page the other night, you know, I didn't read all the comments. I made one little, small little comment, but um, it's, it, I've seen it on the group page before. The word Paul, it's like, I don't even really know how to describe it. You say the word Paul and it just sets off a volcano of hatred and um, hatefulness and he's this and he's that and all these derogatory adjectives and it's really sad um, that people Instead of having conversations like this, where you can be civil and you can disagree and, and say, well, I think this about Paul, well, I don't agree with all of that, or I agree with some of that, um, but here's my take on, on it, and, and be civil and still love one another. And you just, it's so, it's just, it's ubiquitous all over. Facebook and the internet in general, the hatred that Paul is. So I think these kinds of conversations are really super important to have because whether we like it or not, the Bibles that we have have Paul in them and therefore they have to be dealt with and they should be discussed with some uh, civility and some, you know, you know, people can at least try to pretend to be smart and try to pretend to be kind. And um, because I think that when you, when you attack him the, the way that people do, it really leaves a bad testimony about that individual person. And it doesn't serve the kingdom. I don't, I don't see how it serves the kingdom. Some people are just I, seething with hatred. It's, it's amazing the hatred. Mm -hmm. I've never seen, I've never experienced anything like, like it in my life from a group of people who claim to have the love of Yahweh within them. I, I just, it, it, it's, it's such a contradiction in terms. It's, it's unbelievable. And it leaves a bad testimony because you know that there are people that are watching, that are watching these things and seeing these things and they are total unbelievers and like everybody in, in my opinion everybody is, is seeking for something they just don't know what it is and when they see that kind of behavior with the people who call themselves the children of Elohim if I were one of those people I would not want to be anywhere near that crowd so I, I think and, and I'm all for you know you can say whatever you want to say but you know, when you are supposed to be a representative of, of Messiah and, and you behave that way, you are, I don't know, I'm, I'm just too much of a chicken. I, I'm just too afraid that I'm going to get in all kinds of deep trouble if I act like that. Because you never know who's, who is watching and listening. So 
I'm really glad when we have these conversations about Paul, even if not everyone agrees on every single point, I think it's incredibly important. Last year, one time, a group asked me to speak in their group on Paul. And it was an online thing. Uh, people lived all over the place. And I got on there and gave just a little introduction. And immediately, at least three of the people on there, just, what should I say, hijacked the meeting, seething with hate, like taking it out on me because I'm still on the fence here. And what I had to do, I just left. I hadn't said anything but that little spiel to introduce the thing. And they got on and just started walloping. Walloping me. And they probably went on for another half an hour before they ever even realized that you were gone. Yeah, right. Right. It's really sad. It really is. And it doesn't do it doesn't do the kingdom any good at all. There's no good. There's no good that can come for. There's no benefit to that kind of behavior. It doesn't edify. And um, you know, it's if if you don't like Paul, say, well, I don't like Paul, and here's why. And then you can talk about it. And well, I like Paul, and here's why. And then because I personally, that's how I learn. I learn more from people that that. I don't agree with than I do with people that I do agree with because that's how you can, you know, change your way of thinking, shift your paradigms and learn from other people's points of view. That's how I learn. So even people that, <clears throat> that are, as you say, on the fence or people that don't like Paul, I learn a lot about Paul, you know, just from their point of view. And so I, I think if, if, if people would be a little more, um, you know, at the risk of sounding cheesy, if people would just have a little more love in their heart. I know, think that I think sounds like, that sounds like a song. It is a song. Have a little more love in your heart. That's exactly right. <laughs> I was thinking of that song. It's like we get it like uh, again. Uh, what's his name? Mm, M. Scott Peck in that book, uh, "People of the Lie," talks about the Me Lie massacre back in oh, yes, the sixties. Yes. And yeah. he says what he's observing when he studies these things is that a spirit of evil just takes over a lot of people starting with a couple hate-filled people it just like yes. is a pandemic of the rest around there they all catch that and the mob violence yeah at the end of you know they're they're thinking well did i do that or was i part of that they can't remember I found that yeah. out when dealing with demonized people a lot of times. They don't know. And I think it's that way with some of these haters. I think they yeah. just don't realize it. So they, they've taken, they've been taken over. It feeds the beast. Yeah. Sean, you don't have to raise your hand. This is your meeting. <laughs> no, I agree with you, brother. I think I, I think it's it's spiritual wickedness. For sure. Um, I actually, I popped on. I, I'm going to have to get off here. I'm, I'm going to go and spend some time in my hot tub. I think I kind of, I rode my dirt bike today. For those that didn't know, my wife and I went up on some trails and I rode my dirt bike and she rode her four wheeler and uh, I'm 56 pretending that I'm 18. So <laughs> I got to go soak the ache out of me now. <laughs> but thank you very much for having this room, brother. And you keep it open if you want. Well, I'm going to go myself. I've had quite a day today. And I appreciate everybody that's come on tonight. I thought it was very worthwhile discussion. I think Absolutely. we've got something done here. Absolutely. Thank you all.